chapter 11. The word of God says this. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and da about David and Samuel and the prophets. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Now, how many of you are familiar or have ever heard of the tiny house movement? Raise your hand. Let me see. Raise your hand. I see some of you. Okay. The tiny house movement. If you look up on the screen, this is a home that was built by a lady named Macy Miller. This home is located near downtown Boise, Idaho. It is only 196 square feet in size. And it only cost her $11,400 to build it. This home comes equipped with heated floors, king-size bed, living room, washer, dryer, kitchen, and all you need is a pickup truck, put it right here in the front, and you can haul this baby anywhere you want to go. If you go on the tinylife.com, it's going to tell you that over this past decade, this decade that we're living in right now, uh, more and more people are wanting to spend less and less on their mortgage and more on making memories. And if you go on this website, it'll show you how you can build your tiny house for less than 30000 It'll show you how you can convert maybe your van into your home. It'll even show you how to take an old shipping container and convert it into your next dream house, believe it or not. Now, what's the driving push behind all this? Is that we live in a society that's continually telling us bigger is better, but the tiny house movement is saying, you know what? Sometimes in life, less is more. But just in case you were wondering, this is not a seminar on real estate <laughs> or on home improvement. That, this is not a seminar. This is a sermon. This is a sermon on f having faith-filled obedience or, or faith-filled confidence in God. And so we're going to look through, we're going to see through the life of Gideon how little is much when God is in it. Look again at verse number 32. I'll put it up on the screen. It says here, uh, the author of Hebrews chapter 11 says this in the opening line of verse 32. And what more shall I say? Now, if you've been with us over the last few months, we've been in Hebrews chapter 11. And we've worked our way through verse 1 all the way through verse 31 last week, and today we're looking at verse 32. And the writer in Hebrews has pretty much given us a survey of the first six books of the Bible. From verse 1 to verse 31, he's walked us through Genesis through the book of Joshua, and that's what we finished studying last week was the book of Joshua. So it seems here by saying, and what more shall I say, he's taking a deep breath. Have you ever done that in your life where you got so busy, you got so much, you got so focused doing what you're doing, and you just needed to take a deep breath, and just to realize how much ground you've already covered. And the man stops under the direction of the Holy Spirit and realizes that he's only covered the first six books of the Old Testament. And he still has 33 more to go because there's 39 books in the Old Testament. So what he does is he says, let me just create a summary. Let me pick up the pace and let me create a summary to the summary I've already given you about the Old Testament and the saints who live by faith in the Old Testament. So actually, verse number 32 is designed to be a summary to the summary for the rest of the Old Testament. Let me explain. These first four names that you see here, Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, they all belong in the, king, in the book of Judges, which is the seventh book of the Old Testament. All of these men are judges in the book 
of Judges. And then we've got David and Samuel, and what we'll say is they represent the era of the kings, okay? Even though Samuel wasn't a king, but when we get there, we'll learn about his role with King David as well. And then, so we go from the judges, then we go to the time of the kings, and then what we're going to do now is then he says, we'll talk about the prophets and the prophets. So what he's basically done is he's summarized the rest of the Old Testament for us. Now, these names here, we can actually pair them up. We can put Gideon together with Barak. We can put Samson together with Jephthah. And we can put David together with Samuel. We can pair them up. And when we pair them up, what we learn is that they're actually out of order, uh, out of chronological order. Because if you open up your Bible to the book of Judges, you're going to learn that actually Barak comes before Gideon, Jephthah comes before Samson, and Samuel comes before David. So it seems like what the author is doing is putting the more prominent of the two in the front of the line. So what we're going to do this week is we're going to look at Gideon. Then next week, we're going to jump ahead to Samson, and then we'll look at David and Samuel uh, together when we get there, okay? Now, there is a connection between Gideon and Barak, okay? Barak, with the help of a woman named Deborah, defeated the king of Canaan defeated Sisera, the army, the the commander of the army of the king of Canaan. But what that did was create a vacuum for the Midianites to rise to power. Kind of think of it like when you take out one drug cartel, it doesn't take too much time to have another drug cartel rise to prominence And and you might wonder, why do I know so much about drug cartels? I'm just using it as an illustration. I have no idea about those things, okay? So that's what happened. We took out the king of Canaan, and then here come the Midianites. And let me tell you, the Midianites, these these were vicious, wicked, mean people. They were destructive. Look at the way the Bible describes them in Judges chapter 3, verse 4. When the Israelites planted their crops... The Midianites, Amalekites, and the other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. And remember, this is an agricultural society. Imagine if every time you planted your crops, this invading army came, destroyed what you had, or maybe they waited till harvest time and they came and they took everything that you had planted. And then maybe you had your, 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 your farm and you had your goat and you had your lambs and maybe they were pregnant or the sheep and they were pregnant. And every time they were pregnant and getting ready to give birth, here came the Midianites and they either stole them or they slaughtered them. What was happening here? What was happening in Israel? This wasn't an economic recession that they were facing. They were facing an economic collapse. And because of this, many of them had to abandon house and home and to head for the mountains. Look at what it says in verse 2. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Look at where we find Gideon when the angel of the Lord appeared to him. In verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abbey's right, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. See, in Israel, you had the threshing floor where you brought your wheat, you put it on the ground, and then you kind of pounded it into the ground, and that gave you the grain that you needed. And then over here, you had your wine press, right? And some of you can visualize that episode of I Love Lucy when she's in there pressing down on the grapes to make uh, the grape juice and the wine. So you had the threshing floor, and then you had the, the wine press. And the wine press was for the grapes to make the juice to make the wine, okay? But here in this passage, we find out that Gideon took the wheat and he placed it in the wine press. Why is he doing that? Because he's hiding from whom? The Midianites. Now, strategically, 
hiding from them, we could say that. So the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon in the wine press, at the wine press. And look at the way he addresses Gideon. He says in chapter 6, verse 12, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And when Gideon heard that, he was actually shocked. He was confused. He said, the Lord is with us? How can the Lord be with us if we're suffering oppression under the hands of the Midianites? And he's confused because he says, you're calling me a mighty warrior? But I'm hiding from the Midianites right now. And besides, my, my clan that I belong to is like the smallest in all of Israel. So God proceeds to give him a sign that he indeed was with Gideon. Gideon went home and he prepared an offering to give to God. He prepared uh, some meat, he prepared bread, and he had stew. And he came back to God. And God instructed him to take the meat of the goat and the bread and to place it on this rock. And he said, okay, now take the broth and pour it on the, the, the bread and the, and the meat. Now, first of all, I want you to know that that actually was an act of faith by Gideon. Why? Because remember, they're facing an economic collapse. So he's going home and he's getting the food, what he has, to offer that to God. And then he pours the broth on the food. And the Bible says that God takes Gideon's staff and with the tip of the staff, he touches the offering and poof, it caught fire. And when Gideon saw that that offering was consumed, he freaked out. Because he knew he was in the presence of God. And nobody can see the face of God and live. But God was merciful. God showed him grace. God showed him mercy. God called him into service and let him live. And as a result of that, the Bible says that Gideon built an altar to the Lord in that place. And he said, God is peace. God is peace. Because now he was reconciled in his relationship to God. And after God gave him this sign, God then gave Gideon, a little later that night, some instructions. He said to him, I want you to go to your father's house, and I want you to go to the idol to Baal that your father has constructed in his house, and I want you to tear down that idol, and in its place, I want you to offer a sacrifice to me. So it's right here where we can stop, catch our breath, and realize we've got a major truth principle going on here. Because behind the physical battle that they were facing against the Midianites, there was another battle that the Israelites were facing. Does anybody know why the Israelites were being oppressed by the Midianites. Why were the Israelites being oppressed by the Midianites? Does anybody know? Let me show you what the Bible says in chapter 6, verse 1, and chapter 6, verse 10. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Verse 10, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. So behind the battle that they were facing against the Midianites, behind the physical battle that they were facing, behind the economic struggles that they had, there was another battle that they were facing, a battle for their hearts, for their minds, and for their souls. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul teaches in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities, against powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, does that mean that every time something bad happens to us in our lives, it's because of something bad that we did? The answer is no, it's not. 
Because all you have to do is look at the story of Job to realize in the story of Job that even the righteous person will suffer in this life. And it's not directly connected to anything wrong that you have done. So that's not always the case. But it was the case at this place and at this point. Because they had built up this altar to Baal. They were worshiping Baal. And let me tell you something. The only way you can say God is peace is if you declare that Baal is dead. And sometimes there's idols that are in the house that need to be torn down and taken care of in the home before you can experience victory out in the world. And so Gideon's life also points us to Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ came into this world, the Bible says, to bind the strong man. And by binding the strong man, the Bible says that he walks out of his house with his possessions. And when Jesus Christ walked out of that empty grave, he gave us victory. He gave us peace with God, and Jesus Christ gave us eternal life so that we can live in victory. And so, he knocks down the idol. And then, the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. By the way, he knocked down the idol. The Bible says he took ten men. He knocked down the idol at night because he was afraid that somebody would see him. But now, in verse 34 and 35, he's now filled with the Holy Spirit. And you have a radical transformation in the life of Gideon. The one who was hiding in wine presses, the one who was sneaking around at night, is now filled with a divine power, the presence of the Holy Spirit, and now he is openly and boldly calling the nation of Israel to join him as he, joined, as he brings the army together to go against the Midianites and to destroy them. It says he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abizarites to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms and also into Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, so that they too went up to meet them. Look at the transformation that the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit can bring into someone's life. But he asked God for a sign. He understands, he, he, he's realizing, wow, I don't know where this boldness is coming from. Is, is this boldness that I have, is this, is this adrenaline or is this the power of the Holy Spirit? Is this boldness that I'm facing, that I have right now, is this indigestion or is this of God? I don't know. Let's find out. So he asked God for a sign. He said, God, I'm going to take my fleece, my jacket. This is a hoodie. I don't know if Gideon had a hoodie or not, but this is my daughter's hoodie. And he said, what I'm going to do, God, I'm going to lay this fleece on the ground I just want to make sure this is you and not me. And in the morning, I want, I'm going to ask you to make the fleece soaked in water and make the ground around the fleece dry. So he went to bed and he woke up in the morning. And the dew that was in the atmosphere, in the air, saturated the fleece that the Bible says that he took the fleece, he brought it together, he squeezed it, and he filled a bowl full of water, but the ground around there was dry. And he said, God, okay, don't, don't get too upset with me, but I'm going to ask you to do the same thing, but in reverse. I'm going to lay my jacket on the ground, but this time, make the jacket dry and make the ground around the jacket wet with dew. So he went to bed, and he woke up in the morning, and what did he find? The jacket was dry, but the ground around the fleece was wet. And it was after God gave him that sign that he said to Gideon, Gideon, you got too many men in your army. You got way too many men 
for you to have the victory. Does that make any sense? Does that, does that make human sense to you? Right? But, but doesn't the Bible say that, 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 the, foolish, that the, the foolishness of man is the wisdom of God? So he said, let's take the 32,000 and what well, we demonstrated with the kids. You saw that part. Anybody wants to go home, go home if you're afraid. 20, 22,000 left, there's only 10,000 left. I mean, 20, 22,000 left and went home, and there's only 10 left. And God said, still too much. So they went to the river, and those that drank the water out of their hands, I don't know what made them more special. Maybe they were more attentive. I don't know. I have no idea. But he said, with those 300 people that laughed, I will save you and give, you to the, give the Midianites into your hands. And then God says, after this, I'm going to give you one more sign. I want you to take, I want you and your assistant to go into the camp of the Midianites tonight. I got a message for you. So he snuck into the camp, and as soon as he walks into the camp, he overhears two guys having a conversation. This is the conversation they were having. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream. He was saying, a round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into, Mid into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. Look what the man said about this. His friend responded, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. When Gideon heard that, the Bible says he turned around and he ran as fast as he could back to the Israelite camp. And he took his 300 men and he divided them into three platoons of 100 soldiers. And he said, you go here, you guys go here, we're going to go over here. Take a sword, because remember, everybody was there. They took their, they took their I'm sorry, they took the trumpets from the 32,000 that had left their stuff. Let's, the 300 trumpets, let's grab a jar, 300 jars, and let's put uh, the torch inside the jars, okay? And I want you to follow my lead. When I get in position and I blow the trumpet, I want each of you to blow your trumpet and then take your jar. I want you to smash your jar. And after you smash your jar, light your torch. And so that's what happened. They got in their position. By the way, it's 300 versus about 132,000. Okay? Just to put it in perspective. They got in position. Gideon led the charge. He says, when I blow the trumpet, everyone yell, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And he did that. And everybody followed. All 300 did exactly as they were told. Look at what the result was. Judges 7.22. When the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp of the Midianites to turn on each other with their swords. So God gave them the victory. So as I look at this story, this is what I had, by the way, I had, this is how much fun I had this week, okay? Judges 6, Judges 7, Judges 8. This is where I was this week. I took a step back and I said, okay, let's, let's look at this. God, God gave this man three signs. He gave him the fire, remember, because the, the offering was consumed. He gave him the fleece. It was wet and then it was dry. Then he gave him the dream that he overheard the man explaining to the other soldier in the camp of the Midianites. And how did Gideon respond to each of these signs that God had given to him? We had the signs, but look at the responses. The response to the fire consuming the, alt the sacrifice led Gideon to smash the idol in his home. The wet and dry fleece led him by faith to shrink his army from 32,000 to 300. The dream that he heard led him to rally the troops and to conquer the Midianites. 
I got to be honest with you, up until this week, I used to think that Gideon really didn't have a lot of faith. That's why he needed all these signs. But then Hebrews 11 tells us that he did what he did by faith. Now, does that mean that then before we can do anything in our lives, we need a sign from God? Think about that. I mean, I've never had the custom of asking God, I need to see a sign before I do something. Sometimes it's my opinion that that's actually the easy way out. God, if the UPS driver <laughs> shows up at my house before 3 p.m. today, then I know that that's your sign for me to move to Alaska in February. Why would you entrust your future in the hands of a UPS driver and the traffic of Miami? I don't know if we have any UPS drivers, but thank you. Thank you for your service. I don't mean that in a negative way. I don't mean that in a negative way. I don't mean that in a negative way. Let me tell you what's much harder than, than that. What about opening God's word and reading it? What about getting on your knees and praying and asking God to show you what he wants you to do? What about you talking to another believer, a little bit more mature, walks, has walked a little bit longer with Jesus than you have, for their perspective on the decision that you have to make? What about you just, we just stay faithful where we are in our lives until God in his time reveals to us what's the next step that we're supposed to take. You see, that actually is way much harder than checking your watch when the package from Amazon arrives at your front door. I think we could see these as signs, but I actually see it a different way. I didn't see these as signs. I saw this as God manifesting his power in Gideon's life. And that when God manifested his power and his presence in Gideon's life, that Gideon responds to those revelations by acting in faith to God. And in response to what God has, had done, he smashed the idol. He shrunk the army. He conquered the enemy. That it was God who initiates and that it's Gideon who responds. And that's actually the message of all of Scripture. That we serve a God who initiates. That God, we're not the seekers, we're the hiders. That God is the one who finds us. God is the one who rescues us and brings us home. And so that all of our lives is a response to what God has done for us. We respond in faith to God. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. That we respond in obedience to what God's word reveals to us. That we respond in radical obedience to what God has done for us. That all of our lives are in response to what God has done for us. What was the source of Gideon's confidence? Think about that. We said it was God is peace. We said it was the spirit is his power. What's our, what's our source of confidence as Christians? What does it mean to live a, faith a, a life of faith-filled confidence unto God? It's to understand that God is peace. It's to understand that the Holy Spirit is our power. But the only way that you can declare God is peace and the Holy Spirit is power is if you include the third member of the Trinity of God. If you include Jesus Christ and you say Jesus Christ is the victory. God had to reduce Gideon's army from 32,000 to how many to win the victory? 300. And God took the 300 arm, member army and he reduced it to one. And his name is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the one who went to fight for us. You want a sign? I'll give you two signs. The blood-stained cross of Jesus Christ and the empty grave of Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, those two signs are enough for you to blow the trumpet. 
for you to smash the jar, for you to light the torch in this dark world and to proclaim with faith-filled confidence the battle belongs to the Lord. Let's bow in prayer.